Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Outlook for Telehealth and Remote Patient Monitoring, presented by Gluco Inc. I'm Liz Weske, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Russ Johannesson, CEO of Gluco Inc., Tofia Haddad, MD, Chair of Practice Innovation and Platform, the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center, and Professor Carrie Chan, PhD, Professor, Division of Decision, Risk, and Operations, Faculty Director, Healthcare and Pharmaceutical Management Program of Columbia Business School. You can read their full bios on the left side of your window by selecting the Speakers tab. Just a few technical notes before we begin. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please ensure that your volume is all the way turned up. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. Time permitting, we will follow the presentations with a Q&A session. Please submit your questions using the questions and answers tab on the left side of your screen. Okay, now let's begin. Thank you all for joining today. Great. Thanks, Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. All right. So I'll kick us off with our, our first kind of question for the panel here. Um, so besides the U.S. healthcare system's ability to adapt quickly in its use of remote care, what have we learned from the pandemic about the effectiveness of using remote monitoring and care with patients? And Russ, we can get started with you on this one. Sure. Thank, thanks, Liz. And thanks to the rest of the panelists. Um, at Gluco, our clinical research team recently shared some data at the American Diabetes Association Congress back in the spring that showed the effectiveness of remote patient monitoring with diabetes patients, which demonstrated improved and sustained glycemic control at three months, at six months, and 12-month intervals among people with type 2 diabetes. The results showed immediate and sustained glycemic improvement compared to the baseline um, including reductions in average blood glucose levels by about 12%, increases in average proportion of the in-range glucose readings uh, by better than 20%, and de decreases in the average proportion of high glucose uh, readings, uh, greater than 40% uh, reduction in those. So one thing we've learned is that you know patients really appreciate some increased attention and access to the healthcare team. They've also appreciated the access and the convenience that telehealth visits provide them um, as a replacement to the in-clinic visits, especially during the early days of the pandemic when everything shut down. Um, but, but the reality is that patients do still desire some in-person contact with their trusted healthcare teams, and they, they don't want to lose that entirely as we roll out telehealth and remote patient monitoring capabilities more broadly. Um, so we, I don't think we'll be moving to 100% virtual only care models anytime soon. Uh, patients definitely don't want uh, their trusted healthcare team disintermediated from their remote care. They want the two to be working in conjunction and working seamlessly together. So the other piece I'd say is that the number of devices that are available for self-management and remote monitoring is, is is actually dizzying. Some clinicians are reporting, for example, that only about 50 to 60 percent of their patients uploaded a device in preparation for a telehealth visit during the pandemic. And the reasons for this need to be worked out, but one can imagine that having more devices streaming more data to the cloud passively and having really simple user interfaces in the online platforms where users upload their data are really the beneficial way to go. Got it. Thank you. All right. And for that same question, we'll move on to Tofaya. Great. Thank you. I, I agree with all your comments there, Russ. You know, we've certainly seen, you know, rapid adoption and growth of um, some of the traditional uh, telehealth and virtual care services like patient online um, services, use, use of the portal, um, secure messaging, uh, and now even more than ever, um, the use of uh, synchronous video telehealth visits as well. I think we've demonstrated um, the safety uh, of using these modalities to provide continuity of care, um, even in some cases for new patient diagnoses and, and initial consultations. Um, we've shown it's feasible. Um, we have demonstrated um, some early signals of effectiveness as well in terms of replacing or enhancing um, that uh, traditional kind of conventional face-to-face -face care with uh, providers. 
as it relates to remote patient monitoring specifically, this is a really novel um, method of healthcare delivery. And I think one of the things that we've learned um, really through the pandemic um, is again, not only uh, is, is this safe, is this feasible, but um, as well, I think uh, one of the important things when we want to study the effectiveness um, of these novel care delivery uh, uh, models um, is, is coming upon and uh, having consensus on definitions. What does constitute uh, remote patient monitoring? Because um, what we've seen in the literature so far, um, there are very different, um, uh, uh, different programs um, in terms of whether they're using mobile apps or uh, web-based platforms, whether they're using symptom assessments or in using um, devices, wearables um, that are obtaining uh, vital sign data, other uh, physiologic data. And then as well, the clinical operational model um, may vary uh, as well, whether this information is going to a primary care provider or a team of centralized nurses um, supporting a large population. So um, I think one of the challenges uh, that, that we face, um, but it's a good one, uh, is coming to some consensus on uh, definitions and endpoints so we can really more rigorously study the value uh, of remote patient monitoring. But my last comment would simply be that um, historically, uh, the RPM has been predominantly utilized for chronic condition management. And what we've learned through the pandemic is we've seen this emergence uh, of novel use cases uh, of RPM in more serious and complex care, specialty care, um, as well in, in using RPM for an acute condition like COVID-19, an acute illness. And there have been several excellent publications looking at how RPM um, really brought value uh, to the management of COVID-19, um, whether it was reducing readmissions after a hospital discharge for COVID-19, or um, using RPM to manage large populations of patients who are who received a diagnosis uh, and are being managed in the ambulatory setting and being able to monitor them and support them uh, remotely uh, during their acute illness and through the recovery phase. Uh, so again, in that setting as well, we've seen value where patients appreciate um, the support, especially when they're self-isolating, uh, and as well, um, some early signals of reduction in healthcare utilization with safe, effective uh, clinical outcomes as well. So really, uh, the, the growth of RPM uh, over the last 18 to 20 months has just been uh, really phenomenal. Great. Thank you. All right. And Carrie, same question to you. Great. And, and thanks to um, all of my panelists and to Liz uh, for having me here and to all of you who are in the audience as well. Um, I agree a lot with what has already been said. And I'm going to start by uh, expanding a bit on what Russ mentioned um, about patients being more open. And I think if we look at just the growth pre-pandemic, uh, some of the hospitals that I'm collaborating with in the New York City area, the percentage of their visits that were telehealth was around one to two percent. And during the peak of the pandemic, it reached 50 percent. Now, we're not quite at the number, but we're seeing a stabilization around 20 to 30 percent. And I expect that that's going to persist um, even as the pandemic starts to, to regulate. And I think one of the things that we really learned is that there are some types of care that can be changed from in-person to telehealth and still be very effective without sacrificing quality. And I think pre-pandemic, the perception was often that this was a replacement, but we've also learned that it is a complement to supplement the care that is being done in person and also um, that is, is being done um, asynchronously or remotely. Um, you know, as Tafai was saying, some of these um, devices that are being sent home uh, it had been used in the past um, in chronic disease management to, for instance, monitor vital signs and try to prevent uh, bad events from happening, maybe intervening a bit earlier. Uh, but we saw that that can also be used in acute settings with, with COVID. And so this is a way to extend the reach of the health system beyond the very transactional way that our health system is currently set up. You get sick, you go to the hospital, and then you get sent home. 
But these types of devices now create a more long lasting interaction that I think is going to be beneficial both to the patients uh, and the providers longer term. So I think there's a lot of excitement um, going forward. Um, some of it is certainly hyped, but um, there is a, a still a lot of promise going forward. Great, thank you, Carrie. All right, let's move on to our next question here. So, um, and Russ, we'll, we'll start with you on this one. Whether from clinical trials or, or real world evidence, what is research, research telling us in recent years about the type of patients for whom remote care is most effective? Is it beneficial for all types of patient care or should remote care efforts be focused on specific kinds of patients, such as those with chronic conditions? Yeah, I think I think some of this uh, actually just came out in the great responses from both Carrie and Tufaya um, in this last piece, which I violently agree with as well. Um, you know, I think, I think remote care can be effective for both high acuity and low acuity patients. Um, certainly, I think as Tafaya was referencing also high acuity patients, maybe those who are post-operative or just released from the hospital after a critical illness would certainly benefit from ongoing close monitoring. And then the, some of these other use cases around lower acuity patients, um, you know, those who have a chronic condition that requires daily self-management behaviors to keep their disease in control. Um, the thought of providing remote patient monitoring to an entire clinic population I think we found is can be daunting in some cases to clinicians who already are, you know, in many ways overwhelmed and, and potentially subject to burnout given the heavy cognitive load of managing populations that have an ongoing chronic condition. Um, one interesting approach is to take more of a population health risk-based approach where clinicians can define risk in any number of ways using sensor data or electronic health record data um, really allowing them to match their resources to their objectives to determine kind of what's the right proportion of the population that they can serve with remote patient monitoring. But one of the points Carrie made there towards the end of her last comment, I think we, we absolutely agree with that the remote patient monitoring as a complementary capability to the continued in-clinic visit is really, um, I think we're finding um, a way to increase the standard of care over time, not to burden the system with more tools or technology or other things, but a way to, to when used in the right balance with the right type of population at the right time, can really extend the clinical care team's capability to treat populations, both high acuity and, and low. Great, thank you. All right, and Tofaya, moving on to you for that same question. Yeah, great. Thank you. You know, when we think about um, the types of patients that would um, potentially benefit. I think that's a, a really interesting question. You know, some of the observations we've had uh, about our own remote patient monitoring program uh, at Mayo Clinic across our entire uh, organization, um, you know, southwest, southeast and Midwest regions in the United States, including community based hospitals. Uh, in the Midwest um, is that risk of healthcare utilization. So patients kind of that rising risk population showing increased need for um, healthcare resources, um, increased need for emergency department, um, for triage, uh, use of hospitalization, hospital beds. Risk of healthcare utilization does not necessarily mean that patients are going to benefit from an RPM uh, intervention. So I, I think we have a lot of work to do yet to really define who is the best patient or the appropriate patient um, for these programs. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now is actually to leverage um, the entire EHR and to use uh, NLP and machine learning, um, artificial intelligence techniques in order to better identify patients who are going to benefit from the actual intervention and to use that to help identify patients, whether they're in the ambulatory setting um, with a chronic condition or whether they were hospitalized um, for a surgical procedure um, and may benefit from RPM post-discharge. So. I think we have a lot of work yet to do because I, I agree, Russ, we, we can't use a one size fits all and offer this to, to everyone. Um, but I think as well, there, there may be some lower touch um, solutions um, to really facilitate self-care 
um, you know, provide digital guidance, provide um, health coaching uh, to allow patients to be, you know, monitoring um, their blood pressure if they have hypertension, their diet uh, as well. Um, so I think, you know, if we can build the right tools to help support the day-to-day -day management um, for patients perhaps with, with chronic conditions, and then to be able to uh, monitor that data and again identify those who would benefit from uh, a more high touch uh, intervention that actually brings in um, perhaps more more intensive symptom and vital sign monitoring, uh, more support from nurses and health coaches as well. We really want to be able to support that entire uh, continuum uh, of care as acuity uh, and complexity uh, changes over time. Um, I might make just one additional comment um, and, you know, just again to, to really reiterate that um, we've learned so much uh, over the last, uh, you know, 18, 20 months in terms of the ability to use RPM in patients with serious or complex um, conditions with higher acuity uh, conditions. And so I, I look forward to continuing to extend this model of care and research uh, with this model of care in more high risk populations like those uh, myself as an oncologist, uh, those receiving chemotherapy or cancer directed therapy um, immunotherapies uh, for their cancer treatment um, are patients who have had uh, transplants. Um, I think uh, they could very uniquely benefit uh, from these services, help keep more of their care at home, help earlier identify uh, adverse trends in their health data and intervene to reverse the trajectory uh, of any disease or complications of, of their therapy. Uh, as well, I, I'm, I'm really excited about the potential um, for remote patient monitoring to be able to support patients who are participating in clinical trials. We know that um, uh, only a small fraction of patients who are potentially eligible uh, for clinical trials actually participate uh, and barriers, logistical barriers uh, to receiving care uh, at a facility, often academic medical centers where uh, clinical trials are largely conducted is is probably the biggest barrier for patients. So um, it's it's exciting to see how these uh, this this model of care can potentially be extended to help support and bring clinical trials um, closer to home for more patients. That's great. Thank you. All right, Carrie, and now on to you for that same question. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Um, I think both uh, Russ and Tavaya touched on an important component, which is um, who are the right people? And the challenge here is that, uh, as Russ noted, you can't provide this for everyone. And there's real costs associated with that. Certainly there's financial costs in terms of making a device available for every single person that exists, um, but there's costs associated with the time that it requires for the providers and the administrators to manage that. And so I think that what we've seen traditionally because um, of these, these competing objectives, while RPM can be very effective in trying to monitor patient um, care, to improve patient care, um, to intervene before things get too bad, um, it is infeasible to do it for everyone. And so if you're trying to target, it has typically been done with chronic disease management in part because you send home a device with a patient and you know this is a chronic disease, it's gonna be with them for a long, long time. And so you have a long trajectory of that interaction, it's worth it um, to kind of invest in that relationship. The challenge I think that has been there with acute care is that if it's a one-time episode and you're sending home in a device that's, let's just make up something about $100 or so, but it's only a one-time use or for that one week post discharge, the logistics of trying to get that back and make sure that there's access to all the patients that need it quickly become prohibited. We saw during COVID-19 that, you know, oximeters that are, are quite cheap um, relatively, um, that was easy to send home and have people that couldn't stay in the hospital monitoring their oxygen levels and then be told and informed when they should seek care, when to escalate. I think one of the great benefits of this is providing ownership and education to patients as well. 
because the information that is being sent to the providers is also now a, um, available to the patient. And so you start to build an education for the patients of what are the expectations for them to manage their illness. Can they start to understand how dietary changes or lifestyle changes, can they actually see themselves, how that's affecting um, their health status? And so I think that that, again, that building of those relationships and those interactions are gonna create improvements uh, across the board, but we have to be very strategic about it. We either need devices that are ubiquitous, and let's be clear that smartphones and tablets are not ubiquitous, right? We're not at that point. Um, or they need to be low enough cost that they can be uh, accessible to a, a broader um, patient population. Great, thank you. And thank you all for, for your insights on that question. As a follow-up to that question, um, let's see. So whether it's for patient monitoring, delivering care, or patient coach, coaching, what are some of today's most promising applications of remote care? And Russ, do you want to get us started, started here? Sure. I, I think there are many. I think one that hits closest to home for us at Gluco is, is you know, diabetes care definitely ranking up there, given the fact that diabetes is a disease that requires engagement with a pretty intensive self-management regimen at home with people who uh, have diabetes. So since the medical management of it is based on patterns in the numbers and patterns in the self-management behaviors, like whether or not someone's physically active and they're dosing insulin 15 minutes before a meal, many valuable patient provider interactions can occur outside of an in-person clinic visit. Um, of course, coaching for diabetes and prediabetes has gained a lot of traction over recent years and including increase through the pandemic. But, but one thing we've observed about many of the coaching solutions is that um, you have to make sure that they don't happen independent of the person's sort of medical home. If there's no communication back to the clinicians within that medical home, then people with diabetes can become confused by different or disconnected messages that are coming from coaches versus their healthcare providers. So that is one thing we, we see and, and continually try to stay on top of as this continues to, to um, accelerate. Increasingly, healthcare systems themselves are also looking for remote care to improve outcomes in that medically complex population that Tofia was talking about. Um, over the last question or two even, um, those individuals who have multiple medical conditions who may see multiple doctors who may have um, a fragile state of health, really putting them at risk for rehospitalization or negative outcomes. And there's also, I think, a significant growth in remote care for urgent care needs with many hospitals beginning to provide remote urgent care services for those situations that don't necessarily require an in-person assessment. So I think there's, there's plenty of of you know valuable applications and use cases and i think we'll probably as we learn more continue to see more great and sophia do you have thoughts on that as well yeah i i agree with all the comments there and i you know i don't want to be um redundant with some of what i've shared previously but you know again i think um you know our our the ability to use RPM to support large um, population health uh, for patients with chronic condition is is really remains sort of the sweet spot for RPM today. Um, several studies, several meta analyses now showing, you know, um, importantly, the programs must be technology paired with a clinical operational unit. So having that human touch, just dropping the technology in the patient's home is not sufficient. So really when we talk about remote patient monitoring, it's that combination of the technology with the um, the clinical operational unit. And that's where we've seen um, increasingly more consistent evidence that uh, they can reduce hospital readmissions or death, reduce emergency department visits, improve uh, the clinical uh, outcomes of the patients as well, uh, as the example that Russ shared with improved glycemic control when RPM is used in diabetic populations. So, um, but importantly to, to Carrie's point earlier as well, I think that the goal is really to be driving a, in supporting self-management. Um, ultimately, that's the goal with these 
this sort of intensive uh, uh, care delivery model um, is being able to provide patients with more support so they can better self-manage um, their condition. Our RPM program at Mayo is, is not lifetime. It, it is uh, episodic because our goal is to coach patients, to uh, help them fe feel better empowered um, and have the expertise to be able to manage their conditions. Um, and so I, I, I would just say that I think those are uh, where the applications are showing the most benefit today and then looking ahead to the future, expanding that again in more um, serious, complex, um, post-acute, acute conditions, and even potentially for clinical trials. Great, thank you. And Carrie, moving on to you for your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I don't want to repeat too much as what's already been said. I agree wholeheartedly with, with all of that. I guess maybe taking a step back, the way that I think about remote patient monitoring and, and more broadly connected health strategies, you have different tiers at which these tools can be used. And at, at the basic level, it could be respond to the, to the desire of a patient. So the patient has full autonomy. Maybe they want to take the device and, and monitor um, their system themselves, but it is not having anyone interact um, and intervene on, on what the patient is trying to do. Uh, then you can think about going to coaching behavior where the patient has some autonomy, but there's nudges to try to get the type of behavior that's desired. And then at the full extreme is automatic execution. An alert goes off and an intervention is done regardless of whether or not the patient themselves is aware or desires that, that intervention to be made. And I think there are certainly um, different types of products and technology that can fit in each of those, but I do think that probably the majority is sitting in that middle in that coaching behavior, in large part because of um, the human condition. People want to feel like they have autonomy. So I'm just building on what was said um, before. And so taking away that autonomy completely, I think will um, build a reluctance on adoption of these tools. But that said, healthcare is massively complex. And as our population continues to age and as the presence of more chronic diseases starts to become a, um, present in multiple chronic diseases in individuals, it becomes much that much more challenging to balance and monitor and manage an individual's care. And so having that coaching that allows an individual to understand how do all of their medications interact with each other? If I forgot to take a pill to, you know, at a certain time, what are the implications for the other medications that I have to take later in the day. And having that understanding and, and coaching to work through that, I think is really where uh, there's a lot of potential um, and a lot of need, frankly, um, as healthcare becomes even more complex than it already is. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Tavai as a provider here could attest <laughs> to that as well. Great, thank you, Carrie. All right, let's go in to our next question here. And um, Russ, I'll have you kick us off on this one as well. So let's see, where are we today with the acceptance and adoption of remote care and related technologies by physicians, by patients and by healthcare systems? Yeah, I think, I think this is really interesting, especially for those of us who've been bouncing around healthcare and things digital health for the last 25, 30 years. This is not necessarily new, new thinking, new technology, right? We've been hearing about, thinking about, hoping for the promise of remote patient monitoring. And, and even in our own Uco platform, we've had the capabilities built into the platform for a number of years and have, you know, pre-pandemic, we suffered through or, or maybe putting it more positively, enjoyed the same um, adoption rates that everyone else across the industry had, which was very, very low with the forcing function of something like the pandemic, like everyone else, we saw rapid adoption of remote care by clinics during the pandemic, in particular in diabetes, the ability for someone to come in for one of their, you know, maybe three to four time a year in-person visits just went away. So be able to continue to help support and manage those patients, they went to more remote care, virtual visits, et cetera. 
we're seeing with our with our customer and user base that many are still waiting to see how the regulatory environment around remote care evolves in the wake of the pandemic. Um, there were at least in the US markets, and we're seeing this globally in some other markets as well, but many of the rules related to telehealth were relaxed temporarily. Some of those relaxations have expired. Some are in the process of expiring. And, and there is, it's clear we need to continue to evolve the regulatory framework in the US and in other countries to guide us into the future in the wake of the pandemic and how that's going to play out. And while the adoption of remote patient monitoring codes in the US market from CMS is still kind of in the beginning stages, the growth rate looks really, really good. Um, we've seen that data. There's, there's also data, if you go out and find it from folks like Forrester that have found that healthcare providers significantly increase their adoption of RPM. Many expect RPM to surpass in-clinic monitoring over the next five years. Um, at least in that survey, 20% of healthcare providers have already adopted RPM. I think that number is likely higher in many certain specialties in particular. Another 23% in that survey are planning to over the next 12 months. Um, we've seen, you know, the, the previous resistance to adoption was both on the, on the clinician side and on the patient side. And obviously we're seeing both of those things break down. We always, I think, felt like the consumer adoption was going to continue to increase just as the general personal health tech and personal technology and expectations of consumers, even generationally, as we move through, we're going to increase in their ability or desire to use technology solutions for a variety of things, including healthcare. But we're finding that, you know, at least in specific surveys, 50% of US online adults are interested in monitoring their health remotely. That's up from 43% in the same survey back in 2018. Um, and for healthcare systems and payers, the key really is, is around the reimbursement side. Reimbursements for RPM technology and the devices in the ecosystem, reimbursement trends continue and hopefully will stay in place beyond the pandemic. We're, we are still, despite the fact that those codes are out there and there is a, a meaningful new reimbursement opportunity for clinics and health systems, um, the processes around taking advantage of that require changes in workflow and things that aren't always easy to implement. So I think we'll continue to see that. We're still, I think, a little bit in the earlier adoption side on the reimbursement codes, but um, it's promising. And we see it in other countries around the world that we operate in as well that are putting in place new reimbursement methodologies for digital health and remote patient monitoring. Great, thank you. All right, Tofaya, moving on to you for th your thoughts on that. Yeah, Russ gave such a, a comprehensive answer there. You know, I might just uh, build on a, a few specific comments. Um, you know, I was, I've been part of uh, Mayo Clinic Center for Digital Health since uh, 2018. Our Center for Connected Care was established in uh, 2012. So, um, you know, to his point, it's not that telehealth and, and virtual care is new in the pandemic. Um, but I will say uh, adoption, at least on the healthcare system, and especially on the provider side of thing, was so limited um, because of uh, licensure and the ability to practice across state lines um, that was prohibited um, with utilization of telehealth or video visits um, and reimbursement. There was absolutely no incentive to do this when, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, uh, patients would have to, uh, who were commercially insured, would have to pay out of pocket for a video visit. So when there's a lack of alignment between our regulatory um, licensing, uh, credentialing guidelines and policies and uh, lack of alignment with reimbursement models, it's not, it's not a surprise uh, that adoption was so low. But now, you know, as a, as a consequence of the public health emergency with the relaxation of those guidelines, new reimbursement models present both for commercially and uh, 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 government insured patients, um, we see this, you know, dramatic uh, adoption and, and expansion of services. So that was really a requirement uh, in order for there to be acceptance, uh, adoption, and and growth uh, among providers and healthcare systems. Um, I agree with the comment as well that um, you know. It, it, it does potentially, especially as it relates to remote patient monitoring, um, where there are uh, CMS uh, codes for, for, for billing and reimbursement of services, um, it does require a change in clinical workflows. 
And so, um, and potentially even um, bringing in, you know, in our program at Mayo Clinic, we use a team of centralized nurses um, who are monitoring the patients. Uh, and as needed, if, if care escalation is needed um, for a chronic condition program, we do work back with the uh, enrolling provider, often primary care provider, it might be a cardiologist or a patient with heart failure. In our COVID-19 program, we had a centralized team of uh, physicians um, with COVID-19 expertise um, who were overseeing the patients and um, our centralized team of nurses. So this was a very new way to deliver care. And, um, we needed health systems engineers and service designers um, to work with us to make sure that how we brought this into clinical workflows did it in such a manner that there was uh, awareness am amongst our uh, clinical care teams and administrators. There was um, good communication. And importantly, we weren't adding work to their plate. We weren't making their jobs harder by bringing in this program. We weren't bringing them more. We weren't overwhelming them with every vital sign that was recorded. Um, we were just uh, bringing it in in such a manner that was seamless, integrated with routine practice, um, and and didn't provide uh, a data um, avalanche, if you will. Um, so I think those things also help to drive adoption amongst uh, providers. On the patient side of things, it really comes down, you know, first and foremost uh, to access. You know, uh, if, if it's a web-based platform, we need to make sure that our patients have broadband internet access. Um, increasingly, cellular technologies are being utilized um, that can potentially expand uh, the reach with the use of uh, mobile devices. Um, but we know that there are going to be gaps and some patients not covered, and that certainly is a limitation we must um, address. And then I think my last comment would just be about um, this emerging role of digital health navigators, um, people who can help support patients uh, to navigate these, these digital technologies and to learn how to use them uh, in a way to uh, help uh, supplement their health care. So, uh, I look forward to seeing uh, that role uh, continue to uh, uh, grow and expand and be able to support people uh, with digital health literacy, which is critical uh, to adoption of telehealth and virtual care. Thank you. All right, Carrie, and, and your thoughts on that question? Yeah, um, I, I don't have too much to add, so maybe I'll just put in one, one thought on kind of complementing what has already been said. Um, because if you think about the critical factors in adoption and acceptance, from the provider side, it's been said licensing and reimbursement. And from the patient side, it's, it's really about access. And I think if we kind of build on that notion of access, um, there are um, some added benefits, not just that um, you're able to uh, see a provider in the convenience of your home, but as these licensing regulations have been alleviated, it's become much more easy to seek second opinions. You know, in the past, if you have a diagnosis and you wanna see another specialist, perhaps out of state, you'd actually have to travel to go and see that specialist to get that second opinion. And now it's actually very easy to send your imaging and have a, a televisit. And so I think this is wonderful for patients who now can be more educated about what is happening, what are their options and make a more informed choice about their care plan. But I also see a lot of health systems thinking that this is a real opportunity to expand their reach, um, to be able to help more patients that maybe they traditionally would not have been able to access uh, that community. Um, on top of that, it becomes even more critical pre-pandemic we had provider shortages. They had been projected for many years. There are not enough nursing, not enough physicians. The pandemic with the amount of burnout that it has caused, we've seen mass exodus. But what the licensing um, uh, regulation reductions have done is that this creates an ability to essentially pool and aggregate our resources across the country and, and the world in terms of providers. And so, if there is a specialist in another state that maybe has the ability to see a patient now, and this has become really important, certainly in the mental health space, 
where there's such high demand um, for mental health services and the lines, um, the waiting lists are incredibly long. And so being able to seek somebody who is providing care in another state, which would not have been possible two years ago, is now creating more access to the patients, even in spite of the fact that we have this major shortage. Um, and so I think that those are factors that are increasing acceptance and adoption, recognizing the real value that can come from that. Great. Thank you so much, Carrie. All right, moving on to our next question for our panelists here. How feasible and cost effective is it to bring the various components of remote care to hospitals as well as other care settings across the US? And just to change up the order here, Carrie, do you want to kick us off on that one? Sure. I, I think I alluded to this um, a bit more. I think it, it depends. Um, and I know that's an unsatisfying question in many regards. <laughs> But I think it's the extent of the technology itself that's being used if it is a very complex device um, versus a cheaper um, uh, sensor that can be spread widely. But it's beyond just the technology itself. I think um, I was alluding to it earlier, um, the amount of training that is required, both for the patients to understand how to use these devices correctly because you don't want to get erroneous signals that things are uh, very bad or very good when it's because the patient's using it incorrectly. And at the same time, we need the providers to be able to think about how to incorporate this information, this new stream of data into their care plans. And if we don't create those um, opportunities, we're not going to see uh, widespread adoption and, and impact. And so, I think it depends on the area, um, which is why we've seen chronic disease management of the big impact, you know, diabetes. There's a, a large portion of patients that suffer from diabetes. And so creating those centers, creating that training can become cost effective. I think it what it's something we need to be cognizant of is maybe some of those more rare diseases where um, remote patient monitoring can be very effective in their care, but it could be very expensive and we need to think about how do we provide the resources to get these types of technologies into those people who maybe um, from a strictly business standpoint aren't you know, being thought of at the top of that list. Thank you, Carrie. All right, Tofaya, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, I, I agree with your comments there, Carrie. And uh, I think as we think about um, the feasibility and cost effectiveness of, of these types of interventions, again, um, I think there's a, a continuum of care and as well a continuum of different technology and resources in, in clinical operational models in order to uh, provide uh, remote care. Um, one of my favorite um, research studies uh, that was conducted in the cancer uh, patient population, actually there have been a couple now, um, was just looking at something as simple as weekly symptom assessments, looking at 12 different symptoms uh, in patients with cancer receiving active treatment um, and uh, having them just once a week uh, rate their, uh, this list of 12 different symptoms. Um, the information, uh, there were some uh, predefined uh, uh, parameters uh, that would alert and trigger the care team monitoring these patients to when um, the symptoms being reported were out of range. And, and what we saw in that study was um, earlier identification again of clinical decompensation relative to usual care without this type of remote monitoring. Um, and in our in in studies, we're even seeing this improve the survival, uh, the most important clinical outcome, improving overall survival, uh, in a lung cancer patient study uh, specifically. So, you could have a very low touch solution, just an EHR driven um, symptom assessment once a week that could have such a profound impact on patients' quality of life their clinical outcomes in that study as well, uh, they demonstrated the cost effectiveness of this intervention. So something incredibly powered that didn't have any um, device other than um, patients um, using uh, a web or mobile based platform to complete these symptom assessments. Um, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, um, 
with um, a full kind of remote patient monitoring devices, um, clinical grade uh, devices in the home, um, patients potentially completing symptom assessments and reporting their um, physiologic data as well. Um, I, I agree when we think about feasibility, um, if we have to make this as simple as possible for uh, the patients. Um, we need to provide them uh, with cellular enabled uh, tablets or, or mobile devices um, to help overcome uh, the barrier for those who do not have these devices today. Um, having those clinical grade devices, Bluetooth um, connected, uh, pre-connected uh, and Bluetooth enabled um, to make this again as seamless as possible. They put the blood pressure cuffer on and we get a reading in the EHR seamlessly. So um, I think those are the things that will be required um, for um, feasibility. Uh, and then again, we need to continue to drive for more research uh, in terms of understanding the impact of these programs, um, the impact on healthcare utilization, patient provider satisfaction, uh, in very importantly, clinical outcomes. That research is what we can use then to continue to drive reform um, with healthcare policy, uh, reimbursement models that we can continue with adoption and expansion. Great, thank you. And Russ, can we have your thoughts on that as well? Sure, and just maybe uh, agree with the comments made previously, um, 100%. I think when you get to the feasibility question, as you look at it from the from the health system side of the equation, I think it depends on whether or not and when health systems are willing to invest in some of that initial effort to incorporate these care models into their ecosystems. You know, change is hard for health systems, for all of us, but for health systems in particular, and it does take time, it does feel like and seem like, and we're seeing evidence that the market forces seem to be strongly in favor of a long-term future for this model of care as we continue to, to work on the things that Tafaya mentioned earlier, in particular around the alignment of reimbursement and, and regulatory um, and, and incentives in the systems all kind of aligning. Um, in particular, changing workflows and staffing models in clinical settings is always a barrier. Um, and those have been built up over time. They, so they are built in support of the incentives that have existed historically in the system around reimbursement and things like that. From a commercial perspective, we're seeing that the more that, that we as a provider of some of these kinds of services, the more burden that we can take off of the health system or the clinic and make it easy to onboard patients into RPM programs and to actually deliver the virtual visits and handle the data management and billing, both to CMS and private payers, the, the more openness to adoption there is. What Tafaya was mentioning around Mayo Clinic, they kind of built that capability themselves. They centralized some of those capabilities to maybe to allow the regular workflow in clinic settings to, to continue to operate, to beef up those resources that way. But I think another part of this question that maybe we didn't touch on as much is that as more care continues to be delivered in alternative settings outside of the clinic or hospital, in settings you know like the home and assisted living facilities and long-term care settings, et cetera, I think we'll continue to see um, focus on and really requirements for data interoperability and the ability to integrate devices and data and technologies with the medical record and practice management systems, a way that um, doesn't exist as seamlessly today as it really should. And I think that will help break down a lot of these barriers and make the, the feasibility and the, the effectiveness of implementing these kinds of programs um, more and more um, you know, positive. Yeah, I might just build on that, uh, if that's okay. You know, Russ, that's such a great comment because that's something we realized with with our program as well, that we had some limitations in terms of scalability with regard to the data and analytics component of um, mm -hmm. uh, remote patient monitoring specifically. Um, so I, we will need very robust um, uh, advanced analytics and platforms to be able to support population health and monitoring um, just again an extraordinary amount of data um, to be able to uh, know when to appropriately escalate or de-escalate uh, uh, patient care. Um, right now uh, a lot of that work is being done manually by nurses who are monitoring charts, monitoring the vital signs, 
um, you know, we do have uh, some opportunities to uh, alert, but sometimes those alerts are because of um, erroneous information, or sometimes the alert is the patient just walked up the stair, you know, walked up, you know, 20 stairs, uh, bringing the laundry up, and, you know, the heart rate's up over 120. So, you know, if we can, again, uh, use big data um, and use machine learning techniques and, and again, kind of these um, uh, artificial intelligence to be able to uh, help us to, you know, help us to understand the signal within some noise uh, with so much data. That's what's going to allow for more scalability uh, of these programs. It will drive down the cost of the programs as well um, as uh, fewer uh, fewer nurses can take care of more patients um, when we have a really robust uh, data and analytics component. Great. Thank you. And thank you all for your insights there. Moving on to, to a follow up to that question. So what are some of the key barriers to realizing widespread adoption? And Carrie, do you want to kick us off with this question? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we've kind of talked about some of them. I think, um, you know, having digital savvy patients is a, a, is a huge barrier. Um, and just patients, whether or not they have access, there are large portions um, of the world and of the United States that don't have high speed internet, that don't have access to these devices, or don't know how to use these devices, right? And so um, where we are able to address these hurdles, I think then you're gonna see more adoption but until we do it, there's actually a subset of the population that maybe all of these benefits will be realized and then, but we don't wanna leave behind um, a, a large portion. And unfortunately, it is often the most vulnerable that don't have the access, right? So those um, from lower socioeconomic groups that um, have higher prevalence of chronic diseases because of systematic health inequities that have existed over the decades where there's just higher prevalence of um, poor, poor health. And then they don't get additionally the benefit of the increased access that comes with remote patient monitoring and, and telehealth. And so I think that um, trying to find ways that we have more accessibility from a um, you know, broadband uh, standpoint but also trying to come up with tools that don't require that same sophistication in, in technology, being able to use cellular technology. I, both Russ and Tafai have mentioned that many times. Um, being able to use more rudimentary devices, whether it's just text. So maybe instead of having a smartphone uh, type of app, being able to have checks and texting um, responses to do that symptom assessment or, you know, whatever that case may be, because there are a lot of people who don't even have access to the internet. Um, and so I think that those, that's going to be the, the largest barrier. It seems that the licensing and reimbursement, um, barriers are likely to um, be reduced as they have through the pandemic. It's not clear if they'll stay where they are right now, or if we'll see some of them coming back. Um, but as much as that embraced from a regulatory standpoint and reimbursement standpoint, I think that's also going to be a, a key component because otherwise it's not sustainable for the providers to continue to do this. Thank you, Carrie. And Russ, can you share your thoughts on that as well? Sure. I think um, one, one of the factors is that, you know, until the evidence increasingly points to the improved outcomes that we know can be achieved across disease states and that the financial ROI is attainable across the system, the adoption curve is going to continue to be gradual and follow that normal pace of, you know, innovators adopting first with early adopters right after that and, and then really late adopters who come along because the system is really pushing them and steering them in that way. So I think we'll continue to follow that that normal curve. And, and maybe to Carrie's points around access and vulnerable populations, um, you know, addressing the needs of vulnerable populations is, is, is so important through this. And, and we really do need to make sure that 
these modes of care delivery don't create new health disparities that didn't even exist prior to that. So we want them to improve access to care and reduce those disparities. And, you know, the digital solutions that have appeared in the marketplace that facilitate referrals to community organizations that can be, you know, that can address some of the social determinants of health that are wrapped around the issue as well, helping patients to access those resources during remote care, I think is going to be a part of that solution to, to address that piece of it as well. Thank you. And Tofaya, do you, do you want to weigh in on that as well before we move on to the Q and A? Yeah, I, I completely agree that more research is, is needed to continue to uh, drive more, more widespread uh, adoption. And with that, I think it'll be important again that we come to um, consensus on what constitutes RPM um, and what are the right endpoints um, to be measuring the value. Um, as an example, um, we, don't, we do see some studies that are not reducing hospital readmissions or hospital admissions and why is that you know if we can't do care interventions in the home but we can identify adverse trends we need to bring these people in so we might not always move the needle on a readmission rate however what we are starting to see more consistently is that when these people do come in perhaps they come into the emergency department it might not convert to uh, a hospital admission because the ED, uh, the emergency department is reassured that the patient's being monitored closely um, and maybe just some simple interventions were needed and they can go back home. Or if they are hospitalized, we see fewer total hospital days, a few, a less need for the intensive care unit. So again, earlier identification of adverse trends, um, often we can intervene early, um, reverse the trajectory of disease and get those patients back home safely again. So um, so I think research um, and uh, identifying the right endpoints uh, for success um, will be critical for continued adoption at the pe uh, provider and health system level. And I wholeheartedly agree with the comments regarding the digital divide and the potential uh, for digital health and virtual care uh, to exacerbate um, some of uh, the disparities in healthcare that already exist, but they also offer the opportunity to bridge uh, some of those uh, disparities as well. Um, and that's where we really need to double down and invest. I think my last comment would be, we really need to partner with the technology uh, vendors uh, that are out there developing um, the technology that is in the home, uh, supporting patients, monitoring patients. We need to have diversity uh, among those who are developing these tools. We need to make sure that multiple languages uh, can be supported, not just English uh, or Spanish language. So those are some limitations that are real today um, with the technology. And so um, I think it really will take a partnership um, in terms of developing technologies that have a very simple uh, interface um, and are usable uh, by people. Uh, so I think those are some of the opportunities to help with uh, growth and adoption. Thank you, thank you so much. And now we are gonna be moving on to the Q&A portion of our webinar. There is still time to submit your questions using that Q&A tab to the left side of your screen. Um, keep in mind that if we're not able to address your question during the, the time we have allotted here, we will follow up with you personally after the webinar. So still feel free to submit questions if you have them. Um, but moving on to our first question here, and it looks like this, Carrie, is for you um, about something that you mentioned at the beginning of, of our webinar here. So do you think that the approximate 20 to 30 percent virtual visit rate will persist or continue to grow in light of further tech advancements? We've seen a real stabilization um, in terms of the telehealth adoption. And it's, it's very interesting. So if you look at a plot, pre-pandemic, it was it's an almost zero. You see this huge peak and then it's kind of come down and, and then tapered, tapered off where we are. Um, and I think that what we're seeing is that there is an acknowledgement from both the providers and the patients that there are certain types of visits that are more conductive to telehealth. Um, and so they will continue to be able to be uh, provided in that manner. But there are certainly services that are high touch and do require that in-person interaction. 
And so I expect that we're gonna we're not gonna see dramatic changes um, over time. You may see a slight upward increase as maybe some technologies help shift some of the visits that are requiring some in-person um, uh, interaction. Um, but I don't think it's going to, uh, you're not going to see the type of growth that, that happened um, in the early pandemic. I mean, you might, you could imagine a scenario where now people, they, they're for chronic diseases, they need to get labs done. And so they often come into the office so that they can get those services done. But you can imagine a scenario where there's now, um, you know, at home lab kits where you can take um, the specimen at home, send it to the lab, and then you don't actually even have to go in person to visit with the provider. And so you can imagine uh, in those situations that you're going to see more telehealth. Um, but I don't think we're going to suddenly find a completely new area that telehealth is going to be able to take over um, that hasn't already happened right now. Great, thank you so much. All right, and it looks like we have time for just one more question today. We did have a lot of great questions come in today and don't have time to get to them all. But as I mentioned, we will get back to everybody who submitted a question personally after the webinar. So moving on to our last question for today here, and this is for all of the panelists. Um, what is your opinion of cellular connected RPM devices that send results immediately without pairing, syncing, or Wi-Fi needed? I can I can start out maybe with a response on that. <clears throat> um, that is um, super helpful. Let me just say that in terms of the ability to get benefit from uh, from these kinds of devices. Any additional burden that you can take off of the patient in terms of reporting data, asking patients to manually report data, you know, we've all seen you might be able to get that to happen over a very defined period of time for a very specific use case. But to do that consistently puts a lot of burden on patients that frankly have other things they're worrying about. What we've found, and we are a platform that is integrated with over 95% of the devices that are out there that treat diabetes, those devices that have cellular capability where we have cloud to cloud connectivity where data is automatically synced and uploaded and sent to the, to the care team completely at the permission and discretion of the patient agreeing to that sharing of data, but providing that without the patient being burdened with having to remember to sync or to do some other manipulation provides a very um, helpful um, breakdown of one of the areas that, that can be a hindrance in getting, in getting these kinds of programs adopted and getting people to have that visibility in, in real time or near real time. Great. Um, Tofaya or Carrie, do you want to weigh in on that question? Yeah, I, I agree with the comments there. Keeping it as simple as, as, as possible for patients is, is key. So having a, a cellular enabled device, ideally, if they don't have a device, have it provided by the healthcare system. Um, having uh, pre-connected Bluetooth enabled devices um, cloud to cloud, I, I think all of that is is what we need. Keep it simple for the patients, get the data uh, accessible to their, their clinical care teams. Um, and I think that's where we'll have the greatest success. Thank you. All right, so I think that that concludes our talk for today. Um, thank you all for attending this fierce healthcare webinar and for submitting so many great questions. I'd like to thank our panelists for speaking. Um, and for and our, our speakers for participating and Gluco for Inc. for presenting today's webinar. This webinar has been recorded and you will be able to access the recording within 24 hours using that same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Thank you again for joining and we look forward to seeing you at future events.